Okay, I'm Austin Chu. I'm our lead software mentor on 971. Um, I wanted to kind of go, go over some basics on control loops and talk about what that means. So uh, what is a control system? A control system is, a, uh, is something that modifies your system dynamics to make your system stable. So let's look at this. Is this stable? Yes or no? He says no. I get a second no. OK. This is stable. Is this stable? Correct. This is not stable. Is this stable? Yeah. It's blowing up. This one's not stable. Is that one stable? Yes. yes. OK. So what is stability? A system is stable if it converges to 0. OK. So we can go look back at these again. Is this one converging to 0? Yeah. Great. It's stable. Is this one converging to 0? No. How about that one? No. That one. OK. So we can say this without loss of generality, because we can redefine 0 to be wherever we want, to, want our robot to go to, and just, you know, just shift everything. OK. So let's get some more terminology so that we can talk about these things better. So this is a kind of simplified block diagram of a control system. So we have um, our reference. We have our, so we have our controller and our plant. So our controller is the thing that is trying to modify the system. Our plant is the system under test. So this is a robot. This could be a steam engine. This could be um, a chemical plant. Plant t generally comes from chemical plant back in there, back in the last century. So then this has an output, which we subtract from our reference to generate an error, which our controller generates an input, which gets sent to the plant. And this loop just happens over and over and over forever. OK. So here is a control system. So this is uh, the watt centrifugal governor for a steam engine. So here's a valve here. Um, this controls the steam flow, which then spins this. As this is spinning faster, the balls swing out, which moves the lever, which opens or closes the valve. So this is a control system. Software does not have to be involved in a control system. Um, it is a lot easier in this modern era to use software, but you do not need software. So let's. So one of the most, um, I have to say, basic. One of the versions of control systems that you'll see the most often, the implementation is a PID loop. So let's let's break this down. So this is going to be the controller here. So this says that you, the value that we feed to our plant is some constant times our error. So as, as our error is bigger, we apply more power. As our, as our error is smaller, we apply less power. Okay. So we can add another term. So that's the p term. It's proportional to the error. The d term here. So we take the current error minus the previous error and divide it by the time step. So that gives us the change in error over time, which is the velocity. We multiply that by a constant. Um, and then that, so this says if we're going towards our goal really fast, we could lower the power because we're probably going to overshoot it. So let's back off a little bit. It gives us some knobs there. And then um, the integral term, this is a term that we very rarely use. Um, this says let's take all of the errors and let's add them up. So if our system is always too low, we're just going to keep adding a little bit every time, and that will slowly add power. And that'll let us correct. People following? I lost people. Be quiet. I guess that's good. OK, so let's, we can look at this kind of physically. Um, so say our, our u is a force. We're going to push on a mass. Um, our output is the position. So kp times our error. So we're going to apply a force relative to the, to the distance this thing is away from 0. So that's kind of like a spring. Springs apply force proportional to displacement. And then the derivative term here, so this is applying a force relative to the velocity. That's like a dash pot. A dash pot is like when you're moving your hand through water and it resists you, depending on how fast you're moving. So, so those are kind of some physical things you can think about when you're trying to a, tune a PID loop. OK, so let's, let's try some things. So I'm going to use the model from the wrist from this robot here, so this rotary joint here. Um, so let's set KD to 0 and try sweeping a bunch of KPs. So KP equals 5. You can see our response here. Um, KP equals 10. We start going faster here. 
as we start to go to 20, it overshoots a little bit and comes back. Uh, 40, it overshoots more, and 80, it starts to oscillate a little more, but it does settle down. You can kind of see the, the um, effect of KP. KP drives your system to be faster. But if you go too fast, it's going to, it's like a spring in a mass, it's going to oscillate and shake. So let's look at our KD term. So let's set KP to 30, picked a nice middle one. And then let's try sweeping KD. So we started out here with zero. So it overshot a little bit. And then we added some damping. So this, this is kind of like you're adding some resistance. So here we got a nicer response where we didn't get the overshoot when we added some damping. But then as we keep ramping it up, it you know, gets slower and slower. You're kind of seeing the trend there. So this is useful to keep in mind when you're tuning a robot and you're trying to add some damping and you're trying to, you want to understand what it should do and then you can look around, look at your robot and see what did it do. And what is KP and KD? KP and KD. So the coefficients on your proportional term and the coefficients on your velocity term. Okay, so let's, let's put a name to this, okay? The name for, let's put a name to the shape of these responses. So the name that we want to put is called the damping ratio. So this is an underdamped system. So an underdamped system is going to oscillate like this. You know, this is a stable one, so it's going to converge. Um, this is overdamped. So you can see here how it's really slow. It's taken a long time. Okay. And then critically damped is right between the two. So this is as fast as you can be without oscillating. Um, so when you see your robot and the arm is shaking back and forth and stabilizing, you can now say, ha, that's underdamped. And people will know what you mean. OK, so let's look at this. Um, can someone tell me, pick one of those that's underdamped? Yep, pink one's definitely underdamped. Blue one's still underdamped, yep. OK, can someone pick an overdamped one? Someone else? Dark blue. Yep, dark blue's definitely overdamped. OK, so uh, we've, in this discussion so far, we've ignored integral. Um, so we should talk about when we should use integral. I argue you should very rarely use integral in FRC. Um, we, very, we try really hard not to use it. So just try it, see if it works without interval. Um, for an elevator, if you have a mass and it takes a little power to hold it up, it'll sometimes just sit a little bit low. You can just move your set point up. It's, it's not a big deal. Um, I don't like integral because it's really hard to tune, and you'll get really weird responses. Yeah. OK. So let's, let's give some more terminology here. So let's talk about the time constant for our system. And this is the same thing as saying the poles of our system. So the time constant is how long does the system take to decay to 1 over e, so 1 over 2.7. Um, and that number is a characteristic of our, of our system. So here, our system is converging e to the minus 0.5t. So our time constant here is 2. So you can see here, at t equals 2, we're about 1 over e. And then two more seconds, we've gone the same, we've reduced the same percentage, and it continues down. So now you have a name for, hey, I want a faster time constant, or I want a slower time constant. Those tell you how aggressive your loop is and how fast you're trying to converge. OK. Um, we talk about debugging control systems. The, the most important thing when you're debugging a control system is to get a graph in front of you. So you noticed we've had this whole discussion with graphs. I'm showing you what it looks like with respect to time. So there's a bunch of ways to do this. You can plot with Smart Dashboard. Um, sometimes you can just write a CSV file out on the Robo Rio and pull it back into Excel and look at it. Um, I've filmed them. You know, get your phone out and film it and watch it really slowly. You can see, oh, hey, that's oscillating. OK, that's underdamped. Maybe I need to increase the damping or lower KP. OK. Um, so Tyler talked a bit about, in our last talk, he talked about um, designing our software with the control loops in mind. So this equation here is saying that the, the voltage at the current time step 
is a function of the error at the current and the error at the previous. So this is assuming that you're going to run your system at a very specific rate. You know, in our system, it's about 200 hertz. We run a function that does this calculation 200 times a second. And we work really hard to make it so that we run it exactly 200 times a second. So think about this and see if you have this construct in your code. OK. Um, it's also, we can talk a lot about controlling a robot, but it's very important to build a robot that you can control, which is a slightly different statement. So this is about the mechanics. So control systems are hard. We need to think about them. Um, sometimes a piston might be a better answer. It's, it's a simpler system. Um, if you can get away with just a proportional controller, that's better. Just a, the simpler your system, the better. Controls are uh, just like software and mechanical systems. You want to you want to have them be as simple as you can get away with. Um, sometimes, do you need a control system? Can you just turn it off when you get there? Is that good enough? Um, and then I would encourage people to try stuff in the off season. Um, you can my fa one of my favorite things to control is the drivetrain to try and grow, go a distance because you really can't break much with a drivetrain. Like worst case, you spin wheels or you run your bumpers into something. So try it. You know, play with all the terms. Try and, try and reproduce the plots. And that'll make it so when the season shows up, you're more ready. Um, so we've talked about some of the terms. Let's talk about what makes something hard. OK? So I'm going to go over. And this is, we want to know what's hard so we can know when we're signing ourselves for up for more work. Um, and we can make a, a conscious decision there. And we can also change our design a little bit to make something easier to control. OK? So um, with most sensors in FRC with reasonable controls, you can control the within plus or minus about 10 units. So the unit depends on your sensor. So you're never going to be perfectly at your set point. So we need to design our sensors such that we can, um, such that we can control things well. So we can calculate this. So let's pick a potentiometer here. So our analog digital converter on the Robo Rio has 4,096 4, counts. Um, with our divide by 10, that's about 400 positions, which means if our elevator is going to move um, four meters, we can control to about one centimeter. So you can right off the bat, you can ask yourself, is that good enough? You know, can I, if I were within one centimeter this year on placing a ball or placing a hatch panel, is that good enough? If the answer is yes, great, this may be a great sensor. Um, some of the challenges with the uh, potentiometer in these, this use case is that it's noisy. So you'll get some variation. And so that derivative term, where you're taking the previous value, or current value minus the previous for your PID loop, um, you'll struggle to get the damping up super high. Um, but you know, one of the plus sides is these are really easy to program. You just take the potentiometer value and scale it. OK. Um, we buy wire round precision pots from Mouser. I think they're like $15. And they're just. They're much smoother sensors, and they don't fail on us. So I'd recommend buying a nice potentiometer rather than the $1 one from Radio Shack. Okay, So this is our favorite sensor combination. We use this pretty much everywhere. Um, so we, we combine two sensors. So an encoder, um, a CTRE encoder, like the MAG encoder over there, has 4,096 counts per revolution, but it can spin multiple times. And then, um, so it can give you an accurate distance relative to where it turned on. But um, yeah. OK. Yeah, so since we can turn multiple revolutions, we can get more precision, and there's less noise. But you have to figure out how to start your system to figure out where zero is. So the way we do that is we look at the encoder, and then we look at the potentiometer, and we average the two for a while and figure out about where we're starting and then use the encoder to measure distance traveled. You know, and you know, we have a class for that we've put in our code base so that we can reuse it every year. So when the mechanical team installs those two sensors for us in the software, we just set the ratios and we're done. Just instantiate the class and go. Um, one of the things I really like about this is you can turn the robot on and just wait, and you know where you are, as opposed to um, some of the other systems where you may have to move to find a limit switch. So. And then another classic combo is you grab um, a limit switch of some sort. We like to use contactless sensors. So we'll use a magnet and a Hall effect. 
and you slowly move your elevator down until you hit the limit, and then that tells you where zero is on your encoder, capture that value, um, and now you can know your distance. So you can get really high counts, you can be very precise, um, low noise, um, but you have to move your system. And for when you get to more and more DOFs, like some of our arms, it can be very hard to move to the limits without um, running into something. So let's talk about some other things that make things hard. So we talked about time constant before. If you're trying to get a really short time constant, it can make things really hard. So in this year, this was 2017, we had a flywheel. There were uh, 15 balls a second going through there. So you have about a little less than 100 milliseconds to get the flywheel back up to speed before the next ball comes in. So it worked out to be like five to 10 control loop cycles to get everything back up. And that was very challenging. So let's, we can show you kind of how this, what this looked like. This was a, a fun play. So here's our robot. So that, there's the control loop running in there, getting everything back up to speed between when all the balls come in. Okay, and that's happening very quickly. So we spent weeks and weeks plotting the response, looking at how it was recovering, um, tuning it. So you know, a lot of work went into that simple motion. So the fix for that is if you're having trouble, just slow down. If it takes one and a half seconds instead of one second to lift your elevator, you know, it's a lot easier to do in software. It's a lot easier to get the controls to work. So don't be afraid to just slow something down if it's having trouble. It's, it's definitely your, your knob out for control systems. So um, another thing that can be challenging, and this is an example from 2015, is the dynamics can be changing. So say your robot's really light at one point and really heavy at another and you're trying to control it. So here we had, we had the elevator that went up and down, and this could have between zero and six boxes, which was a difference between like one pound and 30. And for a control system, that's rather difficult to, to compensate for. So you, you do that the same way. Oh, I'll show a video of it. So here, we start out with nothing, and you can see there, it's going up and down to lift them. So we, the control loop there has to deal with this ever-changing load. So the way we did this one is we tuned for three boxes. And then we tested with all the variations. We tested with zero to six boxes. And then we just kind of slowed everything down. We weren't going for super fast or responsive. We were just going for stable, and it worked. So that's something, if you want to try and go faster with something with varying load, you can start to like have different control loops for different numbers of boxes and start to change things. But again, that's adding a lot of complexity, and you want to really think about if you need that, or if you can just slow down and have a simpler system. Um, another one that's really hard on control systems is backlash. So this is, um, you have the distance between the gear teeth, and they'll chatter back and forth or you have the slop on your hex shaft. Your gear doesn't perfectly, isn't perfectly locked to your shaft, so as you rotate, it's gonna move back and forth. So it's very hard to control to better than the backlash. So we do tricks like we'll put a sprocket on the output reduction so that we can reduce backlash. Now that's mechanical solutions to help make the control system easier. Um, or you just need to back off your constraints. Can you tolerate a little bit more air? Do you care? Can you just slow it down and be simpler? Um, precision, so if you want your robot to lift something within a millimeter, okay, that's hard. So from a controls point of view. Um, if you really want to do that, you'll likely need to add integral control in. Remember how I was talking about integral control being something we try not to do? Um, this is kind of where, this is part of that. When you want to be more precise, you need to add more terms into your control loop and design a more complicated control system. Um, you kind of you need your mechanical design to be you know, be similarly good, so rigid, low backlash. So if you're trying to control a really floppy arm to within a millimeter, it's not really going to work very well. So um, and then it's going to be very hard to get something to be very precise and fast. You kind of get to pick one. So just something to think about. Can you put a hard stop there? Because are there other ways to be precise and make this work without burdening your control system? Um, this is a fun one. 
So this is actually a system we did in 2018. So if your physics are complicated, really PID loops like to operate on a motor hooked up to a mass. So that mass may be an arm, that mass may be an elevator, maybe your drivetrain, but it's really a motor rigidly hooked up to a mass. And every time you deviate from that, you're gonna have to put a lot of work into your control system. So this was an example where we took a motor, we geared it down, we then put a spring between that and our load. Okay. So the cool thing about this is the deflection of the spring tells you the torque on the output. So we're able, we were able to measure and control that. But it required um, probably one of our more complicated control systems in recent years. And so I, you know, I bring this up as something to watch for. So it's pretty cool what you can do with the software. So here are the control loops active. You can see it nicely moving. I kick it, and then we turn it off, and you can see it oscillate. So let's watch that again. So you can see the nice crisp motion to a disturbance, and then that's when it's off. So that's the spring oscillating. So it's pretty cool what you can do with a control system, but that's a lot of work. So do you really need to be solving that? Um, another thing to watch for, it's kind of a, we've, we've tried a lot of the crazy things that you probably shouldn't do with our control systems, but it is fun to show them. So this was, um, these are nonlinear physics. So depending on the angle of the arm and the velocity of the joints, they're actually coupled. So if you have your, your second joint, if that's moving really fast, it's going to be applying a force to the first joint, depending on the relative angle, um, which is a beast to control. So think about it. You know, an elevator is a lot simpler thing to control here. Would that be a better design for you? Um, I think Tyler might have showed this one. But when you do it right, the results are pretty cool. There you go. So there's very little overshoot there. We're able to get very crisp motion, very controlled. That thing is um, controlling two trajectories. So we have you know, theta 1, theta 2 graphs of, that we're following. Um, another one to watch out for is coupled systems or MIMO systems. So this is where you have two motors that have to work together to get something to happen. Um, so in our case here, we had the turret was connected to the rotor, which was connected to the base. So there's a motor on each. So to keep the turret straight, you have to spin it backwards relative to the middle joint. Um, so it, right there, you know, we signed ourselves up for a controls problem. So um, you can watch. Yeah. So it works remarkably well. You can see pretty how, you know, how steady that is while it's moving. But there you go. So that's spinning while we're holding straight to do the shot. So I just I, I bring this up as uh, to, to caution you. Watch out. Don't try and build a system like this unless you've tried it in the off season and are prepared to control something like that. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yes, great. Do you use other, I've heard um, that you use other controllers in PID. Yep. Um, what would you, how would you recommend trying those out for teams who haven't experimented with them? Have you gotten TAD working? Yes. Great. That's the right answer. Um, there, so the first step in this is a lot of what we do is model-based controls. So you need to know what the physics are of your system. So James is going to give a talk, I think, right after lunch, which I have traditionally given for model, you know, system modeling. So that's the first step in all this. You need to understand how your system is going to perform. And then um, there's actually, we use linear quadratic regulators, but there's math that you can find online to help, help um, control those. Or you can look at our code. We have examples for all this stuff. Um, we've pulled it out into nice classes and tried to make things pretty readable so that we can read it and reuse it every year as well. Um, yeah. Yes. How does the interval control work? What does it do? Great. Okay. So this is a this is a summation. So from the beginning of time to the current time, add up all of your errors. So if say for example we have e. Air looks like this, right? 
So what we're doing is we're figuring out, we're, we're adding all these up, and we're going to get a plot, something like this, I think. And so that's the value we're going to apply. So the basic idea is, if you're always high, keep adding power. Or if you're, if you're now low, start subtracting power. So basically, if your elevator's sitting there and it's always an inch too low, you're going to always keep adding a little bit. So you're going to keep slowly increasing your power until it finally can lift a little bit and recover. It's kind of learning what gravity, how much gravity is affecting your system, or friction or stuff. Does that help? Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things you got to play with a little bit too. Okay. If there's no more questions, then we can. Wrap that up then. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, I'm Rashawn Shaw, a student on Team 971. We hope you enjoyed this video. For more videos and resources, please subscribe and visit our website at frc971.org.